Sweet baby, do not scorn me. Do not be me. Say that you love me not, but say not so in bitterness. The common, the common executioner, whose heart the accustomed sight of death makes hard, falls not the axe upon the humble neck, but first begs pardon. Will you a sterner be than he that dies and lives by bloody drops? I would not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tellest me there is murder in mine eyes. Tis pretty sure and very probable that eyes, which are the frailest and softest of things, who shut their coward gates on a tome, should be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. I do frown on thee with all my heart, and if my eyes be wound, let them now kill thee. Now count the bitches wound, why now fall down? Where thou canst not, oh, for shame, for shame, lie not to say mine eyes are murderers. Now show the wound my eye hath made in thee. Scratch thee but with a pin, and there remains some scar of it. Lean upon a rush the cicatrice, and capable of pressure thy palm some moment keeps. But now, mine eyes, which I have darted out thee, hurt thee not, nor I am sure there is no force in eyes that could do hurt. O oh, dear Phoebe, if ever as that ever may be near, you meet in some fresh sheet the power of fancy, then shall you know the wounds invisible that most kings ever was made. But till that time come not thou near me, and when that time comes, afflict me with thy mock, pity me not. As till that time I shall not pity thee. And why, I pray thee, who might be your mother that you insult, exalt, and all at once over the wretched? What though you have no beauty, as by my faith I see no more in you than what thou candle may go dark to bed, must you therefore be proud and pitiless? Why, what means this? Why do you look upon me? I see no more in you than in the ordinaries of nature's sail work. Oh, my life, little eyes, I think she means to entangle mine eyes too. No, faith, proud mistress, hope not at. Tis not your inky brows, your brown silk hair, your bugle eyebrows, nor your cheek of cream that can attain my spirits to your worship. You, full of shepherd, uh, wherefore do you follow her like foggy self puffing with wind and rain? You are a thousand times a proper man than she, a woman. Tis such fools as you that makes ill fever children. Tis not her glass but you that flatters her, and out of you, she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. But, mistress, know yourself down on your knees. <laughs> Thank heaven, fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you, friendly in your ear, sell when you can, you are not for all markets. Cry the man's mercy, love him, take his offer. Foul is most foul, and being foul is to be made a scoffer. So take her to thee, shepherd. Very well. <laughs> Sweet youth, I pray you chide here together. I'd rather hear you chide in this man's will. He's fallen in love with your foulness. And she'll fall in love with your anger. If it be so, as fast as she answers thee with frowning looks, I'll sauce her with bitter words. Why look you so upon me? For no ill I will bear you. I pray you do not fall in love with me, for I am falser than fowls made in wine. Besides, I like you not. Uh, if you will know by my house, tis at the touches of, of, of olives, here hard by. Will you go, sister? Shepherd, fly her hand. Come, sister. Shepherdess, look on him better. Be not proud, though all the world can see, none can be so abused in the sight as he. Come to our flock. Then, shepherd, now I find myself mighty. Whoever loved it, loved not at first sight. Sweet Phoebe. Ha! Ah, what sayest thou, Silvius? Sweet baby, pity me. Why, I am sorry for thee, gentle Silvius. Wherever sorrow is, relief would be. If you do sorrow at my grief and love, by giving love, your sorrow and my grief were both extreme. Thou hast my love, is not that neighborly? I would have you. Why, that were covetousness. Silvius, the time was that I hated thee. And it is not that I bear thee love, but since thou canst talk of love so well, thy company, which erst was irksome to me, I will endure, and I will employ thee to, but do not look for further recompense than thy own gladness on his voice. So holy and so perfect is my love, and I in such a poverty of grace, 
that I shall think of the most plenteous crop to glean the broken ears after the man who made harvest reaps, loose now and then a scattered smile, and that I shall live upon. Knowest thou the youth that spoke to me erewhile? Not very well, but I've met him oft, and he hath bought the cottage and the bounds that the old Kirlock once was master of. Think not I love him, although I ask him. Tis but a peevish boy, and yet he talks well, but what care I for words? The words do well when he that speaks them pleases those that hear. It is a pretty youth, not very pretty, and sure he's proud. Pride becomes him. Uh, so make a proper man. The best thing in him is complexion, and faster than his tongue to make offense, his eyes can do it up. He's not very tall, yet for his years he is tall. His leg is but so so, and tis well. There is a pretty redness in his work. A little riper and more lusty red than that mixed in his cheek. So it's just the difference betwixt the constant red and the mingled damask. There be some women, Silvius. Had they marked him in parcels as I did, would have drawn near to fall in love with him, but for my part, I neither love him not, nor hate him not. Though I have more cause to hate him than to love him, for what had he to do to chide at me? He said, mine eyes were black and my hair was brown, and now I am remembered scorned at me. I marvel why I answered not again, but that's all. No mittens is no footens. I shall write him a very taunting letter, and thou shalt hear it. Wilt thou, Silvius? Phoebe, with all my heart. I'll write it straight. The matter's in my head and in my heart. I will be bitter with him and pass him short. Go with me, Silvius.